Welcome to Canadian Beer Journal. My name is Kevin. Today we're going to be finally finishing up our run on oatmeal stouts. For any of you that have been watching the last couple, you know that the series has been fraught with uh, technical difficulties and bad scheduling on my part. And haven't been posting as much as I would have liked, um, but whatever it is. The beer is, as promised, Oatmeal Yeti from Great Divide Brewing. Um, definitely been looking forward to this beer for quite a while now. Um, I think it should be great. Anyhow, local beer news. Uh, I have decided that I am going to go to Beer Fest. Uh, Buddy and I got tickets, so we're going to end up going. Um, just check out what's there. Um, like I said, the last couple of years, it's been kind of just like a product show for the LCBO and the beer store, which is a little bit disappointing, but there are tasting events, and you know, you can get exclusive cask beers there, so hopefully I'll uh, see if I can find some way of recording it. I'm not sure if they actually allow recording there, but uh, I'll see what I can do. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, not too much outside of that. Oh! Uh, my dad and I are going to a beer and bacon festival, actually, in Buffalo, New York. So that's going to be fun, I think. Uh, and while I'm down there, of course, I'm going to try to load up on uh, exclusive beers that one can't get in Canada. I think I found a place that reliably stocks Alesmith stuff, so I'm hoping to get some of those. Alesmith is another one of those breweries. It just seems like whatever they do ends up in the top ten for that particular category. So hopefully get some of those. All right, on to the beer. The beer is Oatmeal Yeti, Great Divide Brewing. Uh, not normally available in Canada. This is brought up to me by my buddy Patrick, who paid quite a premium, it looks like, there. Um, $13.49 for $22. And keeping in mind, this isn't South Carolina. This isn't up here where beer prices would kind of expect to see things like that. So um, he did, by the look of it, get it out of season. So maybe they were stocking them up and then selling them later at a higher price. Uh, now they're hard to get. Whatever it is, um, for those of you that don't know Great Divide Brewing, they are an absolutely amazing brewery out of Denver, Colorado. And I like them for a number of reasons. Um, first off, they make great beer. That's the best reason to like a brewery. They're independent. That's a personal reason uh, why I like the brewery. They have a great diversity of styles. Uh, many breweries just focus on one style. I think I've talked about, say, Wellington Brewery out of Guelph really focus on English style beers, Bose Brewing, uh, Cremor, we're now Molson, but even when they were independent, were very much German beer focused, those two breweries. This brewery, uh, amazingly enough, seems to do authentic beers in a range of styles. So you'll get English Old Ales with their hibernation ale, or they do uh, Marzen, uh, which is a type of German lager, which is extremely authentic as well. They do Belgians. And they also do the sort of obligatory American craft styles. They have the Hercules Double IPA, which I think comes in at about 10%. Big, big beer. Uh, their most famous, though, or prolific, anyways, so I got a fly buzzing around in here. Their most prolific line is their Yeti series, which is their Imperial Stouts. Uh, now, the basic Yeti is a really burly beer, 9.5%, I think 75 IBUs. Definitely a much more American interpretation than a British interpretation. While it's not as crazy as some of these uh, monsters like the Stone uh, Russian Imperial Stout or something like Speedway Stout from Ale Smith, etc., etc., definitely 9.5% is much larger than something you'd expect to see out of a sort of classic English uh, interpretation of the style. It's also probably one of their most um, widely messed with or um, Sort of, they have a lot of versions of it, is what I'm trying to say, more than 10. Um, right off the top of my head, I can think that there's a basic oak age, chocolate oak age, chocolate oak age with uh, chili peppers in it. That one's really good. Um, there is a barrel aged version that's very limited that only comes out uh, once a year, I'm pretty sure. There's a vanilla one, Belgian one with be uh, Belgian yeast. There is a, I think, I thought there was definitely one more. Espresso oak age as well. I think there might be some other ones. Yeti with bread. Uh, so, a great deal of them there. This is the latest version. This came out in 2013, last year. Um, and as the name suggests, what they've done is replace some amount of the malt with uh, rolled oats, in this case. 
what they've also done is add raisins to the kettle, um, which is an interesting addition. We've been finding those dark fruit notes in the past couple of oatmeal stoves that we've been doing. Uh, so I guess they're just trying to enhance that even more. Um, but what is interesting to me, uh, and yes, they have a bottled on date, which is good. 9.5%. This is the exact same strength as the other versions of Yeti, which tells me a couple of things. One, that they have control over the brewing process, because changing up the grain bill and adding something like raisins, being a dried fruit or very high in sugar, to have it come out with the same strength implies that they're really, you know, they know how to make sure everything stays in line, even with uh, varying factors. And the other thing it tells me is that they're comfortable with their um, recipe. They don't feel the need to change it up. Certain breweries, they'll do special editions of their beer that almost seem nothing like the basic beer. With all of the versions of Yeti, you can still tell that it's the same beer underneath, just with one element change. So they've oak aged, they've added one ingredient, they've changed the yeast, they've, um, in this case, changed the grain, but usually you can at least tell that there's a uh, great divide Yeti underneath. Anyhow, that was an excessively long intro, so let's get the top off of this. It does have the champagne foil on it, which uh, you know my thoughts on that. So get the wine opener here, get the stuff off. All right, hopefully that stays out of the beer. Yeah, no smoke or anything. Uh, I'm going to go into my Muskoka Brugel glass here. Alrighty. So, ended up with a decent size head for a big strength beer, about half a finger, uh, if you're using my fingers. Quite a bit of carbonation in there. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see. There it is. Quite a bit of. Bubbles much more again than I expected. Um, sort of cola like uh, head and carbonation. Totally opaque. Black, just jet black in there. So, typical of a high strength Imperial Stout. Let's get an aroma on this. Very interesting. I'm getting some of those typical um, Imperial Stout notes. Uh, you do get a bit of booze. Uh, there's a bit of like tobacco in there. Maybe a little bit of coffee, but there's definitely something else happening there as well. At this point, to me, it almost smells like a red grape or something like that, or almost a red wininess. And again, a uh, tiny bit of that sort of baked quality of what I was discussing last time with the uh, San Ambois, which I take to be the oats. So very interesting. Again, like the San Ambois, uh, in the sense that you could tell that that beer was related to a stout, um, this one still definitely uh, has all the hallmarks of Imperial Stout. So. We'll see. Cheers. So right off the bat, I get that kind of baked sort of note going over the tongue. Then I get a little bit of the dark fruit and some of the raisins. The raisins seem distinct, though, from an almost sort of plum note. And then as it goes over the back of the tongue, you're getting a very dry, espresso-y, um, slightly molasses, typical strong bitterness. Um, it does finish quite dry. I feel more from the alcoholic strength than the hot bitter. There's definitely a bitterness there. Um, but it's hard to separate a distinct hot bitterness from any other kind of, like there's a lot going on there. So you do still have those fairly intense roasted notes, but you also have a more pronounced dark fruit, raisiny note, and still that sort of biscuity baked quality um, that I've enjoyed in the other oatmeal stouts that we've been looking at. 
Um, this bottle has actually been aged out a year. You can see this was bottled July 16, 2013, and we're here on July 18, 2014. So it's actually a year and two days. So this might have settled a little bit. Uh, I unfortunately don't have like a brand new bottle to compare it directly to. I tend to like these beers a bit better after they have some age on them, so I'm happy. But <laughs> um, I'm going to let it warm up a bit more, and hopefully it'll open up even more, and I can give you some more comprehensive tasting notes after that. All right, see you in a bit. Welcome back. So the great thing with some of these more, uh, well, high-octane beers, to be honest, is that they change over time uh, along with your palate. Now, it's not just, as the beer warms, you're going to get different notes. You're going to get um, certain notes coming out and certain notes falling back. But it's also going to be your palate because the alcohol is so strong in this, your tongue is going to get a little bit numbed to certain notes, but it might pick up other notes better, or you might appreciate certain notes a little bit differently uh, as the beer interacts with you. So that's the nice thing about one of these big beers. Um, over the course of an evening, you can just have one and almost have a conversation with it. Not to get too wanky about it. So I'll give you um, sort of a rundown of my total taste notes now. I've definitely gotten a more cigar kind of note here happening. Uh, because in addition to the sort of standard soy sauce and um, that baked quality that I was talking about before from the oats and the dark fruit and the heat and a little bit of, uh, let's say dark chocolate, not really coffee and espresso, more uh, dark chocolate. The other notes that I've picked out are cedar and smoke and sort of an ashy smoke, not like a hardwood smoke, like a like something like a charcoal, like when you light up a charcoal barbecue. And in addition to the tobacco note that I was talking about earlier, it really leaves me with the impression of like a fine Cuban cigar, but not one that's being like blown in your face, like some some beers that I've had that are just really like distinct. Um, this is more like someone has smoked a cigar maybe a day or two ago in a room and you can still kind of smell it. Uh, it's nice if you like cigars. In terms of taste, let's get a refresher here. Now that it's warm, uh, it's opening up with a sweetness, but more of a molasses, um, raisiny sweetness, actually. The raisins really come out now that the beer is warmed up. Uh, I'm getting less of that sort of baked quality and more almost like a chocolate cake or chocolate donut sort of quality. So. There's still some influence of the oat in there. It's definitely lightening things up. It's still adding that sort of um, baked quality to it, but not like a pie crust kind of baked, more like, a, like I'm saying, a chocolate cake or something like that. Tobacco appears again uh, on the palate, especially as it warms up. Uh, they're still drying bitter. I'm not really detecting the hops, to be honest. Um, there's like maybe a tiny bit of a herbalness way, way in the background. It is hard to detect, though, just the focus here is on the malt bill and on the alcoholic strength. And on that note, there is a fair amount of heat. 9.5%, um, I can excuse this level of heat. I don't think it indicates anything negative about the brewing process. And if anything, I think they've kind of let it hang, so to speak, because it adds another dimension to the beer. With When you're talking with these really huge beers, the alcohol becomes almost like a third element you have the aroma, you have the taste, but you also have the heat. Um, and in addition to the uh, mouthfeel and appearance and things like that, but as sort of a sensory element uh, that directly affects your intake of the beer, the heat and the viscosity and those sorts of things do affect the way that you appreciate the beer. So I don't think they're trying to hide it necessarily. Um, it's not overwhelming though, like some beers that you have you just tell there's almost something off with them. If they have too much heat, it kind of indicates maybe something went wrong in the fermentation. That's not this. This is very, very well balanced. It's just got a little enough of the heat to know that you're drinking something uh, a little bit different. So how does it stack up to the other Yetis? I've had, I'd say, four or five of them. I mean, there's so many. Uh, my goal, my ultimate hope, would be to collect all of the bottles. 
um, of all the various kinds of Yeti. Um, but so far, all I've had is the standard one, which is very, very good. The basic oak aged one, which is nice. It added sort of elements of vanilla and stuff like that. And because it necessarily had to be put down for a little while, um, it's a bit calmer, just straight out of the bottle if you get a fresh bottle. Um, had the chocolate with chilies one twice now. Very, very good, although the chilies sort of kind of confuse you with the alcoholic strength, or at least me. Um, well, I appreciate what they're doing. I don't really like the additional heat. Uh, I don't know, that's a personal preference. Also, the espresso, which I have to admit is probably still my favorite. And now I've had this one, and this one I would say is a close second. It's really an interesting beer because the oat influence, like on the Santa Bois, is there, but it's supporting the style as opposed to completely going against it or completely changing the nature of the beer which might have been the issue with the Trafalgar smoked oatmeal stuff that I was talking about in the middle of this series. I might have been a bit harsh on it when I said that basically it's like they're selling an English brown ale as a stout. I think they might have just genuinely gone for it and maybe added so much oat that it uh, kind of backed off all of those malt notes and came out that way. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not going to change my rating because at the end of the day, the beer was what it was. But with this... I think they've struck a really interesting balance between the familiar notes that you would want out of an American double stout or American interpretation of the uh, imperial stout, but also added those neat elements of uh, the kind of baked pie crust and cakey sort of notes and let room in for the dark fruit notes, which they've accented by adding in raisins. So. Not sure if it's going in my top 10 yet. Um, I think it's going to, I don't think it's quite going to beat Espresso Yeti just because I'm such a fan of, ch of coffee and espresso beers, but damn close. In terms of food pairing, that's always going to be a difficulty when it comes to Imperial Russian Steads. They don't tend to play nice with a lot of foods because they're so intense, because they're so. Um, you know, uh, bitter, and there's a bit of sweetness there, it can be hard to pair them with sort of traditional entree fare. The traditional thing to do would be to have it with something like a tiramisu or, uh, you know, chocolate cake or something like that. It's kind of boring, maybe, uh, if you've already done that a couple of times with Russian stouts. Again, sort of uh, with what I was recommending last time, I think you could maybe get away with, say, a pepper steak or a really well-spiced pot roast, like a sort of southern-style pot roast. Um, you might be able to get away with that uh, along with this. Anything lighter than that, though, I think even pork, and especially chicken, and forget about fish, all you're going to taste is this, um, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, if the fish dish kind of sucks, then just pour yourself one of these and choke it down. But if you want to enjoy the flavors of what you're eating and what you're drinking, I would definitely, if you're going to do it with an entree, do it with a heavy entree. Um, in terms of a vegetarian alternative, maybe a bean chili. I think you'd be, I think it'd be hard to do it though. I think still, even with the, like a bean chili or something like that, you'd mostly be tasting this. That one might work actually with the uh, chili and chocolate. Yay. Anyhow, Great beer. If you're in the States, pick it up. Uh, as with any of the other Yetis, if you can't get this one specifically, any of them are going to be fantastic beers. Just a great, well-balanced, but still interesting, sort of higher-octane beer. So, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Cheers.